All right, we are here with Leslie Lamport, the 2013 Turing Award winner, and congratulations. How, how does it feel to be a Turing Award winner? Well, thank you. Uh, the award should come with a warning saying, caution, this award is dangerous for your mental health. Yeah, uh, and your inbox. Lead, it may lead to bloated ego. <laughs> And you probably got a couple of congratulatory emails afterwards. Uh, huh? A couple, yes. Yeah, yeah. And uh, so where were you when you found out? Well, it's a funny story. I was uh, sitting in uh, an airport in a, in a waiting uh, area in the San Francisco airport about to board a plane for a vacation in Iceland. And uh, I happened to uh, be uh, connected to the Wi-Fi there. And Link told me that uh, I had a phone call at the office, and I would usually have ignored it, but on a whim, yeah. I decided to answer, and that was the phone call. Wow. And, uh, and so what you, what was the first thought in your head after you hung up from that phone call? Uh, I sp actually, the first thought was, could this have been a hoax? <laughs> yeah. It took a while before I got some further email to uh, convince me that it wasn't. I mean, that's a good start to a vacation to begin with. <laughs> but did you get a chance to celebrate, or have you, uh, you even celebrated yet? Is it all sunk in? Uh, well, I guess the uh, closest to a real celebration was uh, uh, the night before I flew here to Redmond, uh, my wife uh, got a uh, split a half bottle of champagne yeah. and uh, we uh, celebrated that way. Nice. But, nice. Uh, so your, uh, your paper, Time Clocks and the Ordering of Events in Distributed Systems, it's one of the most cited papers in computer science. Mm -hmm. And th it's incredible because that's from 1978. Why do you think that's so often cited? It seems to have taught people something. And I'm not sure exactly what. Yeah. Uh, the significant part of the paper is that it introduced the idea of uh, implementing a distributed system uh, by using a distributed implementation of a state machine. Mm -hmm. But that part of the paper seemed to have gone unnoticed for quite a few years. In fact, on two occasions, I've been talking to people, and they've insisted that there was nothing about state machines in that paper. And I had to go back and read the paper <laughs> to make sure that I wasn't uh, imagining it all. Yeah. Uh, there's something about uh, giving them, people, a new way of thinking about distributed systems that yeah. seems to have helped them. Mm -hmm. uh, the idea seemed... Uh, totally obvious to me, uh, although when I, was, when I had the idea for the paper, I felt that it was going to be a good paper, but I had no idea it was going to be you know, that popular. Yeah. Um, and uh, sometimes soon after its publication, uh, I was chatting with Jim Gray, and he said he had heard had, people had two reactions to that paper. Some people thought it was obvious, and some people thought it was brilliant. Yeah. And my reaction was that I couldn't argue with the first, yeah. and I didn't want to argue with the second. Yeah, well, everything's obvious after you've read it from someone else, sure. Yeah. Um, so Paxos is used in almost any major distributed system today. Uh, can you explain what it is for the, the novice, and even start with what is a, dis a distributed system? Well, first of all, there's the notion of a concurrent system mm -hmm. where you have different agents, or they're usually called different processes, who are operating concurrently, independently of one another, but uh, communicating with one another. Mm -hmm. A distributed system, uh, so that covers uh, things like multiple cores inside of the same computer. Uh, and my definition of a distributed system is one in which the time needed to communicate between the different agents is long compared to the time uh, it takes the agents to perform actions locally. Mm -hmm. My mind originally, that was what distributed systems from other concurrent systems. What has turned out, I think, to be more significant is that distributed systems, 
or these days are ones in which you expect some of the agents to fail. Mm -hmm. And so unlike traditional in multi-core applications, you expect that you know, if the computer is working, then all of the cores are working, you know, not just some of them. Now, this may change in the near future when you have hundreds of cores on, you know, inside the same computer, and uh, your computer will have to tolerate the failure of some of them. But uh, for the moment, uh, the distributed systems are ones in which you have separate computers uh, talking to one another over uh, some communication medium like Ethernet or Internet. Mm -hmm. And there's a question I, I didn't explain of what a state machine is. Um, a state machine is a, a mathematical machine, uh, you know, like a Turing machine, uh, uh, in which is very simple. It has a state and it performs actions by receiving an input, uh, changing its state, and producing an output. So state machines are basically uh, very straightforward because things happen one after another. Mm -hmm. You make your action of uh, withdrawing money comes either before or after my action of depositing the money. Whereas in a real distributed system, uh, you may be, I may be doing the deposit uh, in, uh, Kazakhstan, and you be, may be making the withdrawal in Beijing. Yeah. And uh, it's not too clear exactly in what order they come. Mm -hmm. And so what my time clocks paper showed is how you can implement an arbitrary state machine in a distributed system by appropriately sending messages and keeping what are called logical clocks. Mm -hmm. Uh, but that uh, algorithm didn't handle failures. And what the Paxos algorithm does is a, implement, is a general algorithm for implementing a state machine in the presence of failures. As a computer scientist uh, in 1978, I mean, you, you knew about uh, Moore's Law and kind of where things were going. But how, how is the world now different from what you kind of expected in, in 1978? Um, well, personally, I don't think I learned about Moore's Law till uh, later than 1978. Yeah. I don't feel that I had any particular ability to predict the future or to mm -hmm. foresee uh, the future. The things that I've done that have turned out to be important, like working on distributed systems in the first place, uh, came about not because I thought that you know, distributed systems are going to be important but that I thought that the distribution is an important concept yeah, yeah. And, and therefore an interesting concept and therefore it's worth studying. Mm -hmm. And interesting fundamental concepts turn out to be useful things to, to understand. So I, I want to ask you about uh, the way that you approach problems. People who know you say you have a, a clarity of thought that's not often found in, in people. How, how is your thinking process uh, different, as far as you can tell? I mean, it's hard to say how others might think, but what is your, your thought process when you approach a problem? It's hard for me to say how it differs you know, from other people. Um, a colleague told me that Ed Dijkstra said to him that I have a very good ability at abstraction. And I think that characterizes well uh, what distinguishes me from most people. Uh, the ability to, I think as, as you put it, to see the essence in a problem uh, and not be distracted by details. Mm -hmm. And uh, often it seems to me that what I'm doing, I mean that abstraction that I find, uh, is perfectly obvious, but it apparently isn't to most people. I don't know where I got that or sense of abstraction, how I developed it, but I know that um, it came through mathematics, mm -hmm. came through my background as uh, a math student, and 
uh, basically getting my uh, doctorate in mathematics. I mean, all of my education has been in mathematics. And so that's part of, uh, of the story. But I also realized that I had something that was different from even most mathematicians, is that I've always had a need to be able to understand things from the first principles in mathematics. That is, the thing I loved about mathematics is the ability to prove things from axioms yeah. and to understand, in some sense, the, the complete picture. And I think it may be that desire that gave me the incentive to look at computer systems and try to understand them mathematically, which meant try to understand the underlying principles. So that's part of the story. Uh, the other part is that, uh, paradoxically, is that whereas uh, other computer scientists looked at problems in concurrency as mathematical problems, I tended to look at them more as problems in physics. So for example, uh, Dijkstra's great contribution, which uh, really started the field of concurrent programming, was his paper in, that introduced the mutual exclusion problem. And the mutual exclusion problem is the problem of, you're given a, a collection of processes, uh, each with a region of the code called the critical section, and have them synchronized so that at most one process is executing its critical section at any time. And most people, I think, saw that as a programming problem or a mathematical problem. And I saw it as a physical problem, a problem of two agents and really keep them from doing two things at the same time. And uh, mm -hmm. that sense of it as being a physical problem, I think, eventually uh, led to my producing what, in a sense, is the first real mutual exclusion solution, that is the first solution to the mutual exclusion problem that didn't depend on some lower level primitive that assumed mutual exclusion. So I read in high school you used to uh, work with computers and back then you were uh, looking for vacuum tubes. Mm -hmm. um, for people who, I mean I started with punch cards, but for people who are uh, younger and don't uh, know what that was like, explain what computing was like back then. Did you have to build systems? Were they kind of cobbled together? Or did you work with um, like, you know, larger systems that belonged to someone else? This was actually before the days of operating systems. You, when you programmed, you had the raw computer. And the, had, your program had the computer all to itself. Um, and fortunately, or perhaps as a result, uh, by necessity, Computers were a lot simpler then than they are now. Um, and I found that to be, I think, quite useful to have a sense of what real computers are like um, in uh, my later career. I started really working with computers, really programming computers, the uh, summer I graduated from high school. And I worked in odd jobs, uh, programming, uh, throughout my uh, you know, education, part-time jobs in the, you know, in, during the school year or summer jobs. And I never thought of connecting uh, computing with mathematics. Uh, the one idea, actually, I had was I thought that it might be cool to be able to uh, write computer checked proofs of uh, mathematical theorems. And I was you know, totally naive at the time. I remember it was somewhere in the early 60s before, as far, before perhaps before anyone was actually working on it. Uh, and I thought uh, that being very naive that it might 
make it maybe four times as hard to write a proof that could be checked by a computer as writing an ordinary mathematical proof. Uh, and I discussed the idea with my math professors, and they thought it was a terrible idea. That it would take all the fun out of math, so I forgot about it. Who were the people who most encouraged you or inspired you from high school on in this field? Well, there was, in my first uh, summer job, was at Con Edison, the uh, utility in uh, New York City, uh, a man named Norman Brown, who I haven't seen in, since I last worked at Con Edison, which was in uh, maybe 1959. Um, he inspired me by giving me little programming uh, problems and uh, even uh, some mathematical advice. And uh, you know, if he's out there somewhere, I would like to thank him. Uh, then I, would, I think the next major influence on me was uh, Dick Palais, who was uh, my thesis advisor uh, at Brandeis. Um, he taught me that real mathematics could be done completely rigorously. Mm -hmm. uh, I never studied computer science, and as I never took a computer science course, and my influence, you know, the people who have influenced me, are basically people I regarded as colleagues. Uh, and they're just too numerous to, uh, to mention. Uh, if I would single perhaps someone out as, as the primary influence, it would be Dijkstra through his, uh, through his papers. Mm -hmm. So for someone who's in computer science now and, and looking to graduate, what, what things would you suggest that they read or things that they should look into or study? Well. First of all, computing is a huge field. For people who want to be programmers or system builders, what I would advise is to learn as much math as they can. Uh, not as much math in the sense of math, topics of mathematics, like you know, esoteric math, but to develop a facility with mathematical thinking. Because as computer systems become more complex, more difficult to understand, and as they become more critical to our daily life, the building computer systems will depend more and more on the type of abstract critical thinking that one develops by learning math. I'm not sure if I have anything to say about other areas other than if you, when you're in university, your goal should be to get an education, not to get job training. You learn your job on the job. University is a time to educate yourself. What is the work that is most passionate to you? Well, at the moment, it's the work that I'm doing now, which is on formal specification and verification, which is a highfalutin type of term to say that I'm trying to get people and give people the tools to be able to think properly about the systems they're building. And what I've come up with uh, is a particular language called TLA+, whose goal is to get people to, to think outside the code, in particular to think at a higher level in the code, because I think that's the key to developing better systems. Mm -hmm. So it may be tough to get started, but what are the benefits to it? Well, the immediate benefits are that you have tools that will allow you to find high-level bugs in your systems, high-level design errors, before you start coding. And that is enormously useful because you don't want to find fundamental design flaws you know, after you've coded your system. Mm -hmm. Because uh, 
correcting them by just patching the code is, does not work very well. Uh, it usually just introduces new errors. And starting from scratch is obviously very expensive. The longer term goal is that doing it improves the way you think about the whole process of how you write code. And engineers have told me that it just has been a game changer to the, for them in terms of how they go about thinking about systems and designing them. And it really improves what they do. What's the next big problem that you'd like to tackle? Well, I would say that it's too late in my career to tackle big problems, but uh, that would mean misleading. I don't think I've ever tackled big problems. Yeah. Early in my career, I think I probably had some grand goal of developing a theory of concurrency. And that never happened. Something that um, Bob Targin just mentioned to me a couple of days ago, uh, he said, I never was one to develop grand theories. I just worked and solved little problems. Mm -hmm. And what I pointed out to him is, yes, you just worked on a bunch of little problems. And then when you look back, you realize you, know, you, realize you had done, created a grand theory. Yeah. And it was that way with me. I never, I always felt uh, like a failure because I never succeeded in making a theory of concurrency. But when I look back, uh, by just solving one little problem uh, and that leading to another little problem and just a series of, of little problems, uh, I look back and I created not what I would call a theory, but I created a path that others have followed. Yeah, and I think this award speaks to the importance of all of those. So congratulations again and thanks Thank for being here today. Thank you.